US based nonprofit which is dedicated to connecting students and faculty in the developed and the developing world. So today's live link is connecting the Department of Mathematics at of Georgia South University at the uh, Statesboro and the Department of Mathematics of the University of Ghana. So we're thanking Dr. Jimmy Dillis the faculty of GSU Math and Dr. Margaret McIntyre, Chair of the Math Department of the University of Ghana, for making this possible. So, Jimmy, it's, it's all yours now. Thank you. Everybody's hearing me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, Legon, can you hear him? Uh, Legon? Legon? Uh, can, you hear, can you hear him? Hello? Québec, tu m'entends, Julien? Yeah, I think I think we can all hear you. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, thank you, Jonathan, for the introduction, and thank you for giving me the chance to talk at the same time in Ghana, Albania, Belgium, Georgia, and Canada. I don't think I gave so many talks at once ever yeah. in my life before. So, okay. today I would like to talk about. Uh, some research I'm doing in algebraic geometry, which is related to physics, actually. And I will talk about what I call skeletons of K3 surfaces. So the motivation for this talk actually comes from physics. OK. So when people study physics, they realize that the four forces that we encounter in nature, electroweak, electrostrong, gravitational and electromagnetism actually can be put together into one package. So these forces have different ranges, but if you go back in time, so if you go closer to the Big Bang or if you go at higher energy, there is a way to wrap them up into one theory. So the aim of physicists is to actually have a super theory that englobes all of those. Unfortunately, so far, we haven't been able to do this. We haven't been able to do that one because Experimentally, it requires high energies. And two, uh, theoretically, we have an issue. And the issue is the following. The strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, and the electromagnetic force, we can wrap them up into a grand unified theory using quantum field theory. This has been done over the last few years. The problem is gravity. So physically, gravity and these forces interact perfectly well, but they have a very different nature. So gravity talks more somehow about the nature of the universe, while the other forces are really like interactions. So how do you unify them? This is something which is pretty challenging that Einstein, basically the last years of his life doing, and he never got very far. He never got far because actually it requires really like a new insight. And uh, while there are different candidates for this, the main theory that sort of like stands out of the lot is called string theory. So what is string theory? Well, string theory is a physical model where instead of having particles which are just points, you know, imagine the basic components of nature to be little strings. So objects are not anymore one-dimensional, they are zero-dimensional, they are not one-dimensional. They are like little ropes in the world that oscillate. And different modes of oscillation correspond to different particles, a bit like a violin. If you play the violin and you hit the strings, depending on the tension and the proper modes, you have different notes. So this is how strings get differentiated into different particles. So this is the first and very big conceptual leap, but it's also something very different in terms of geometry. Why? Because if you look, for example, at your interaction of two particles, which is the picture on your left, what you have here is a rough diagram. You can see this as a payment diagram of just a sketch of the path of the particles. You really have a graph. So a graph is nice, it's combinatorial, but there's not much geometry to it. If you go on the string theory part, on the other hand, strings interacting can now be seen when they when you look at the evolution over time as a pair of bands, so as a geometric surface. But this is something which suddenly gets much more interesting. For example, on the physical point of view, if you look at the interaction of particles, there is a clear point where the particles interact. 
in terms of string, it's very hard to pinpoint where is the location where the strings become one and split again. So there's a new geometry, there's also new physics, and uh, this is why it's so fruitful, both for mathematics and physics, but it's still a very open subject. So I said that strings are not little points anymore, they are no little loops. The question is, like, where do these loops live? Because if we look around us, there are four dimensions, but we see nowhere little loops, so they need somehow some extra space. Where is this extra space? So there are different versions of string theory, but somehow people can boil down our universe to a 10-dimensional universe. So 10, that's pretty big. So what are these 10 dimensions? Well, first, you have four dimensions from space-time. This is the usual four dimensions that you have learned from mechanics or general relativity. So you have the three spatial dimensions, and then you have the time. So you wrap them together into Minkowski space-time. So the four there is something which we are very familiar with. The problem is that we want to get to 10. So mathematics requires the theory, requires 10 dimensions for the theory to make sense, to not have some issues or convergence, etc. So we need six extra dimensions. What are those? Well, physicists somehow predict that this should be what people call Calabio threefold. So before I go to what a Calabio threefold is like, let's try to sort of imagine how come we only see four dimensions. There are different ways to see this, but I would like you to look at a picture of them. So imagine that our world, instead of being three-dimensional, was only one-dimensional, like the rope on which this little guy is walking. So this is the world that this person is perceiving. So from far, his world is one-dimensional. He can go forward, he can go backward, but he doesn't have any more freedom. There is only one dimension for him. However, if you look close up, there's a little zoom I do there, there's a little ant on that rope. And to this ant, suddenly there is much more freedom. I mean, the ant can also go up and down. So, while well, for the person, there is only one dimension, for the ant, the world has two dimensions. The ant can go back and forward and backwards, and it can go so up and down. So this is the way that people see that uh, these six-dimensional dimensions are there in our world. They are very compact, they are wrapped up, and they, are, they have a very small radius. So at our scale, it's not apparent. But if you were very small, so the equivalent of this ant, then you would be able to detect these six extra dimensions. In terms of math, people call this uh, vibration. So basically what you have is you have a base space, which is Minkowski space time, the line, and then you have a vibration where each fiber is this kind of BO threefold. So, so here you should be sort of like asking yourself a question. You say, wait, six dimension, and you call this a threefold? It's because in the remaining of the text, I'll talk about complex dimensions. So the 10 dimensions are real, so the six dimensions are real, but they correspond to three complex dimensions. So kind of BO threefold, is a three-dimensional complex variety, which corresponds to six real dimensions. So, what's a Calabio manifold? This is probably the most technical slide. Here. So, a Calabio manifold, this is a Kähler manifold that carries a nowhere vanishing holomorphic top form. So, first, before we try to understand the definition, let me tell you that this definition is not unique. So the term Calabio is relatively recent. So people have introduced different definitions. They are not all equivalent, but they have a big area of overlap. Okay, so taking this definition, you're not missing much, but unfortunately there is no global definition that sort of would be uh, technically interesting enough. So I'll stick to this definition. And uh, before we explain what Kähler and Noer are watching holomorphic top form us, let me give you some examples. So the most familiar examples that probably many of you have already encountered are elliptic curves. So elliptic curves, if you look at the affine model, so if you look at them in the plane, they are curves that can be written after a change of coordinate as y squared is equal to x cubed plus some other terms. Or topologically, it corresponds to a torus. Basically. So imagine you have your torus, you cut it by a plane, 
that's the real section, and what you'll get basically is the picture on the left. So elliptic curves are the one-dimensional Calabio value. In two dimensions, we have two types of examples. So we have abelian surfaces. So abelian surfaces are the product of two tori. So basically, they are pairs of components on two different elliptic curves. So this is fine, but uh, abelian surfaces are not very interesting in terms of physics uh, for various reasons, among which their fundamental group is not how it should be in terms of generation of particles. More interesting are what people call K3 surfaces. So K3 surfaces, you can define them as being Calabio manifolds in dimension 2. But to exclude the abelian surfaces, you just need to add a condition that they have trivial fundamental group. Uh, it's fine, but what do they look like? Well, concretely, they could be, for example, a quartic and p-tree. So if you allow me to go back, the picture here we have on the first slide is an example of a K3 surface in P3. It's called the Kummer manifold. So these are very nice objects. So what we are interested in now are studying these Calabio manifolds. Because when physicists realize that the six extra dimensions need to be built with something geometric, and they came up with the conclusion that it ought to be a Calabio manifold, at first they were really thrilled. Why? Because K3 surfaces are really well understood. Abelian surfaces are the same. Elliptic curves the same. And they thought that, well, since they are so easy in dimension 1 and dimension 2, probably there's not much choice from which to pick in dimension 3. And quickly we should be able to settle which Calabio uh, threefold is actually forms the remaining six dimension of our universe. To sort of like confirm their first intuition, at that time, people knew very few examples of Calabio trifolds. Unfortunately, as people started to get interested, they realized that you had infinite number of Calabio manifolds coming in many different flavors and many different continuous families. So suddenly came a new problem, it's like, which Calabio manifold is the right one? So people have been doing a lot of what I would call mathematical engineering to come up with Calabio manifolds, which would be physically relevant to string theory. But fortunately, it's not very easy, and it requires a lot of techniques. One of the ways you can construct Calabio threefolds is by using lower dimensional Calabio manifolds. So in our case, one way to do this is to use a K3 surface, an LT curve, take their product, so consider at the same time a point on the K3 and a point on the LT curve, and maybe model by some finite group. This is a very fruitful technique, which was invented first by Borcha and Guaza, which I extended with some other colleagues to higher dimensional automorphism. So automorphism or elliptic curves are well known. You don't have much freedom. There are either translations, or in special cases, there is uh, complex multiplication. But that's basically it. For K-tree surfaces, actually, uh, it's a wide open question. People have made a lot of progress over the last three years, but four years ago, people knew near to nothing about automorphism of K-tree surfaces. So what we are really interested in now are understanding automorphism of K-tree surfaces. So, but before this, let me go back to what a Calabio manifold is and explain each term separately. So first, there's a term killer that applies. So a killer manifold. What is this? That's a complex manifold. So meaning we work over the complex number. It can be given, for example, by a complex polynomial in complex uh, space, etc. And this complex manifold should come with a Hermitian metric. So a Hermitian metric is like a Riemannian metric somehow, but it is uh, taking input and values over the complex numbers. So there are some other technical conditions, but the way you should see it is somehow a generalization to complex number of a Riemannian metric. And if you have a Hermitian metric H, then you can associate to it a two form, omega. So what's omega? Omega is the opposite of the imaginary part of H. That's a two form. Well, if this two form is closed, okay, meaning that the omega is zero, then the manifold, the manifold is called Keller. Uh, there are some physical reasons why people would ask this, and also technical reasons, but geometrically it's a very useful. So what's a Keller manifold? It's a complex manifold with a Hermitian metric. And yes, here the two form is closed. Can I give you an example? Well, 
Yes, it's actually very simple. Because if you take a complex curve, so a one-dimensional complex object, I mean, all the two forms are zero. So are so being killer is a vacuous condition. So any one-dimensional complex manifold is killer. Recently, Sue from Harvard also showed actually that any K tree surface is killer. So there are many killer manifolds around us, and they are usually very interesting. So this was for the first condition. The second condition was to have a volume form. So what does it mean to have a volume form? So if you have a, a manifold of dimension n, having a volume form meaning having a way to compute the volume of the whole manifold. So what you need for this is to be able to write locally an object as f of x1, xn, dx1, dxn, which vanishes nowhere. So for example, if on the line you write x minus 1 dx, that's perfectly fine, but it's going to vanish somewhere. So having a volume form is easy to do for some manifolds, but it's not always the case. So if you can write a volume form, and if your manifold is scalar, you have what is called a calabion. So I think this is the most down to definition. So I want you to remember this expression here, because you should keep this in mind later on. And this should also remind you of what appears when you compute an integral, when you measure something. You know? We'll talk about change of variables later. So I mentioned earlier that to construct Calabial tree folds, a very good way is to take lower dimensional components, study their symmetries, glue them together, and push. So for this, we need to understand what the symmetries are of the k tree surface. So what do I mean by symmetry? But let me give you a simple example. Imagine I'm holding a white square, like the one you have on the left. And suppose I'm asking you to leave the room for two minutes. Everybody gets out of the room. I'm taking the square and I'm rotating it by 90 degrees. If you re-enter the room after that, there is no way for you to know whether I did something to the square or whether I left it alone. So a transformation which leaves the object apparently unchanged, that's a symmetry for an automorphism. For a square, it's easy to figure out what the automorphisms are. You have eight of them. This is a simple game in groups. The problem is that when you have complex objects, like higher dimensional varieties, how do you study their automorphisms? How do you find their symmetries? Well, sometimes we are lucky, because there are lower dimensional objects that live on our complex and complicated manifolds that can help us all. So in the days of K-tree surfaces, the automorphisms I would like to study are not all the automorphisms. I'm interested only in looking at a special type of automorphisms. These automorphisms are called non symplectic So what are these non symplectic automorphisms? So suppose you have a Calabio manifold. If you have a Calabio manifold, you have your variety X, your manifold X. And remember, you have your volume form. I call it omega here. So if you have a, a symmetry of your manifold, it changes the manifold to itself, but it will also act on the volume form. It's like a change of coordinate. Think of it this way. So what you want is you want your change of coordinate to not leave the volume form invariant. So it should be changed. Okay. So an automorphism which changes your volume form is called non-symplectic. So in the case of K-tree surfaces, changing your volume form doesn't give you that much freedom. The only thing you can really do, actually, is just multiply it by some uh, primitive root of unity, so, at, at least in the canonical case. So what's a non symplectic automorphism? It's an automorphism of your Calabio manifold that will send your volume form to some non-trivial multiple. OK? So for the rest of this talk, except one slide, all my manifolds will be two-dimensional, so they will be K-tree surfaces, and I'm just going to look at automorphisms of order three. You can look at higher order, but just for simplicity, order three will be sufficient. So before we delve to the case of K-tree surfaces, which are in two dimensions and are much more complicated, at least let me give you one concrete example 
something very down to earth of a non symplectic automorphism in dimension one. So in dimension one, remember that Calabio manifolds are elliptic curves. So I told you an elliptic curve, you can look at the fine piece of it, so forget about infinity for a moment, and this can be written in the plane as y squared is equal to some polynomial of degree three. So here I choose a special elliptic curve, one which has some extra uh, symmetry compared to a generic element. So I pick the elliptic curve, y squared is x cubed uh, plus one. So I did a very rough sketch on the right of this elliptic curve. So that's the real part. We're missing a big part of the picture just to give you some idea. And the volume form on this, you can work it out. You can simply write that dy over x. Okay. Now as an automorphism, I'm going to look at the automorphism from x to x, from the elliptic curve to itself. That sends x to, I don't know if it's very visible for you, to the third root of unity squared times x, and y I'm going to leave it invariant. So first you have to see that this is indeed an automorphism of order 3. And indeed it's the case. If you multiply 3 times by a cubic root of unity, x squared, which is still a cubic root of unity, you'll get back 1. So we'll get back to where we were. So that's an automorphism of order 3. It's also well defined because if you take your zeta 3 squared and plug it into x cubed, it vanishes. So this automorphism sends indeed a point of the elliptic curve to another point of the elliptic curve. So as an exercise, what are the fixed points of this? Well, for the fixed points, we never have to worry about uh, x, we have to worry uh, about y, sorry, we need to worry about when will this be fixed? A fixed point will have x equal to 0, because 0 will be sent to something times 0, which is still 0. So what are the points of x coordinate 0? Actually, you have three of them. You have 0, 1, 0, minus 1, and actually there's also a point at infinity, which is, as I said, not on this picture. Okay, so there are three fixed points. Well, what's the action on the volume form? What happens to omega when you send x, y to zeta squared x, y? Well, since y is invariant, dy will also be invariant. So the numerator of our volume form, dy, remains unchanged. What about the denominator? Well, the denominator is x. So it's sent to zeta squared x. Oh, but zeta squared, you can send it on top. It becomes simply zeta, because remember that zeta is a cubic root of unity. So omega is not invariant, but omega is sent to zeta times omega. So this is exactly what we required. Phi is an automorphism of the elliptic curve, which does not leave the volume form invariant. It's just a non symplectic automorphism. Okay? And in this case, it has three fixed points. This is the kind of problems we would like to answer in higher dimension. So if you would like to see this in a different way, remember that an elliptic curve, topologically, for example, we can see it as a torus. So a torus is what? It's a parallelogram where you have identified opposite sides. So what's the action of your automorphism on the parallelogram you have in the bottom? Well, it's the, the three fixed points are the lower left corner, which is identified with, of course, the upper right. And then the two center of gravities of the two um, equilateral triangles making uh, or tiling your parallelogram. So if you look at these points locally, the automorphisms look like a rotation. So locally, the automorphism is very nice. It's like a rotation. Globally, it's something a bit more involved. So this is for the one-dimensional example. Let's now go to the crux of our talk, and let's jump by one dimension. So now I tell you, here is a K3 surface. It's given by some maybe complicated formula or by some relations. Study its automorphism. And you're like, oh, where do I start? But before I'm looking at the global picture, I told you for elliptic curves that locally it looks like a rotation. So maybe we should also do the same here for elliptic surfaces, uh, for K3 surfaces, sorry. And look at what happens locally. 
So here is your uh, K tree surface M, and I look at the phi point P. Okay? So, for example, you have a point Q which is sent to phi of Q, but P is fixed, so P is sent to itself by the automorphism phi. So we have your manifold and you have a fixed point. So the question is, what happens around P? Well, what happens locally, well, you can model this by what happens on the tension space. That's what you do in calculus. What you do in calculus is you find a tangent line to give basically a behavior near your point. So since our surface is smooth, we can also do this and we can sort of ask ourselves what happens on the tangent space of P when we act by phi. So Gaston has told us that there is no problem. We can do this. So we can study the action of phi on the tangent space at P. And moreover, the action that we will get up to a change of force, of course, will be diagonal. So I have an automorphism that acts on the whole of M. Now I'm going to look at what happens on the tangent space of M at P, on TPM. Now, what's the tangent space of P at M? That's a vector space, and the origin is fixed. So what kind of action am I looking at? I'm looking at the linear transformation. So since we are talking about surfaces, I'm looking at a matrix of dimension 2 by 2. This is my P star that I have at the bottom. And what did Carton say in his theorem that this matrix can be diagonal? So my matrix here is a 2 by 2 matrix because I'm dealing with a surface. And by Carton, the top right and the bottom left entry are 0. Fine. I still don't know what are the diagonal entries. Well, actually, I do. What is phi? Remember that phi is an automorphism of order 3. So phi star, this is the induced action, should also be an automorphism of order 3. So remember that when you take the product of diagonal matrices, what you're doing is just multiplying the diagonal elements. So what this means is that the entry that I have here on the diagonal should be third roots of unity to a certain power. In this way, when I take phi star cubed, I'm certain to get back the identity. Can I say something else? Well, yes, I can say something about my exponent k1 and k2. This is a bit more difficult, but we can understand this using the volume form that we saw before. Remember, a volume form looks locally like f of x, y, x1, x2, xn, times dx1, dxn. So this is really like the weight in some measure. So you're trying to measure space. Now, remember what happens when you do multivariable uh, calculus, when you change variables in your integral. What happens when you change your, your, your variables? Well, the function gets transformed, but the dx1, dxn also gets transformed. It gets multiplied by what? It gets multiplied by the determinant of a matrix. Okay? Because remember, the determinant of a matrix is what tells you what is the change of area of a linear map. So if you have a linear map, say, from R2 to R2, and you have a geometric object and you look at its image, you would like to know what the area of the new geometric object. Well, it's sufficient to multiply the initial area with the determinant of that matrix. So here it's the same. So the change of volume given by phi star will be given by the determinant. But what do I know about this change of volume? Remember that I'm looking at the non-symplectic action on a K3 surface. So I want my volume form to be multiplied by the third root of unity. So here, the determinant of phi star should correspond to this change of volume form. So the determinant should be equal to the third root of unity. So what does it mean? It means that zeta 3 to the k1 times zeta 3 to the k2, the determinant here, should be equal to zeta 3. So since these are third roots of unity, it means that the exponents, when you add them up, they should be congruent to 1, not 3. Okay? And this way, we'll have a matrix which is of order 3, who acts on the volume by multiplication by a third root of unity, and which will model our action locally around. So this is already a very good piece of information because it tells us what the action looks like locally. And before we go to the global picture, let's try to see what are the options. What could K1 and K2 be? I don't think we have so much choice. And indeed, what are the possible K1s and K2s that add up to 1 or 3? So 
here, in fact, trying to solve this equation here, k1 plus k2 congruent to 1, 1, 3, and looking at integer coefficients, either 1 is 0 and 1 is 1, so 0 plus 1 is 1, not 3, or both exponents are 2. 2 plus 2 is 1, not 3. Oops. So if you look at an isolated fixed point P, a priori isolated at least, the local actions are very simple. They can be only of two natures. They will either be of the form zeta 3, 1 on the diagonal, or zeta 2, zeta 3 squared, zeta 3 squared on the diagonal. So what's the first case? The first case is a situation where P has an eigen direction, where star looks like the identity. And it has another eigen direction where it's a rescaling by zeta 3. So in other words, what does it mean? It means that P has a direction where all the other points are fixed. So P lies on an isolated fixed curve. Hold on just a second, sorry. Sometimes you see it as a plane, but in 
imagine it as simply as a line. So it's a line, but you're going to add one point at infinity. So where are you going to put this point? So you could imagine it to be disjoint, but that's not geometry. That's just simply some algebra there. So topologically, what we'll do is we'll add this point at infinity. And we'll wrap up the complex curve. So you remember that complex number for the plane. What you do is you wrap up your plane and you add a point at infinity and you get a sphere. Okay, so this is what the projective line looks like. Topologically, it's a sphere. You should think of this as all the complex number and one point at infinity, which is just uh, which is just infinity. So algebraically now, how can we talk about the projective line? Well, the projective line is your sphere, which is in the center of the big picture. So it's a, unfortunately, the color did not pass through the scanner. But if you look on the left, you have three layers, like an onion with three layers. The central layer is your P1C. So you have all the complex number, and the bottom point is infinity. So how do we deal with this algebraically? Well, algebraically, we are going to see this as two, being two copies of C. The first copy is the outer layer. It's just C. It's parameterized by X. Okay, so you see, for example, the points 0, 1. The problem is, how do you deal with infinity? Well, to deal with infinity, you look at another copy of C. But this other copy of C will be centered around infinity. So the inner layer is your second patch. So, and in your second patch, what you have is that 0 corresponds to infinity, and how do you go from one patch to another? Well, wherever this is well defined, the coordinate on the first patch x will correspond to a coordinate y on the second patch. So for example, one will agree on both coordinate points. One will be sent to one. Two in the complex number will be corresponding to one half in the patch centered around infinity. What about zero? Well, zero is not there, but somehow it corresponds to infinity and vice versa. Okay? So algebraically, how do you think of P1? You think of P1 as being two copies of C that are glued the same way that you have on the drawing on the left. And it's basically the complex number plus an extra point at infinity. So it's very simple. It's just a line with a point at infinity. So what about automorphisms of P1? So since we're acting on the whole K3, we also expect probably something to happen on P1. Well, there's a simple proposition that you can show that if you have an automorphism of P1 that fixes at least one point, well, then change your coordinates. Assume that that fixed point is zero. Well, you can see this transformation now as just being a homotopy, so sending z to some lambda z, lambda fixed, and the fixed points will be zero and infinity. So in other words, an automorphism of P1, which is not trivial, will have two fixed points, which up to two coordinates will be zero and infinity, and the automorphism itself will just be a rescaling. So, just a simple example, imagine that you send all the complex number, you multiply all complex numbers by two. Zero is sent to zero, all the other complex number moves, and of course infinity is sent to itself. Two times infinity is infinity. So an automorphism of P1, which is not trivial, will have two fixed points, which are uh, zero and infinity, up to a change of coordinates, and the fixed points are zero and infinity. Okay, so how is this useful? Well, suppose that you have a point P of type 2, 2 on your K3 surface, which lies on the rational curve, which I call C1. Okay, I don't know what happens with uh, my uh, C1, but what do I know? I know that P, for example, is of type 2, 2. I'm taking an example here. Suppose that P is of type 2, 2. What does it mean? It means that around P, the transformation looks like multiplication by zeta square, whatever direction you choose. Okay, it's just a rescaling. So, how does phi look like when you restrict it on P1? Well, if you choose P to be zero, it's what you have on the second picture. Phi looks like sending x to zeta square times x. Okay, because P is of type 2, 2. So I told you, if you have one fixed point, you must have another one. I'm calling this point Q, which in this system of coordinate corresponds to infinity. So 
what kind of point is Q? So P is of type 2, 2. Can we say something about Q? Well, yes, we can. It's magic. Because now Q is also a fixed point. So I could also imagine that Q is the identity, that Q is 0. So how does phi look like around Q? Well, let's look at the little square we have in the top left of our slide here. So what did I say? I said that around P, so if I choose P to be 0, my transformation phi looks like multiplication by zeta squared. So this is the first line. In the X patch, so in the patch around 0, my transformation phi looks like multiplication by zeta squared. What about what happens around Q? Well, how do I go to Q? Remember, I change of coordinates. And how do you change coordinates? You just send x to 1 over x. Okay. So in the new set of coordinates around Q, I call them z. Well, where is z sent? Well, x is sent to zeta squared x. So how do I go from the first row to the second row? Remember, the change of coordinates from one patch to the other, from 0 to infinity, is by inverting. What's the inverse of zeta squared x? So the inverse of x is z, okay? This is by definition. And what's the inverse of zeta squared? Oh, it's zeta. Remember that zeta is the third rule of unity. So what does it mean? How does phi look like around infinity? Well, if you choose the center of your homotopy to be infinity, phi looks like a homotopy again, but this time we shall send z to zeta z. Oh, what does it mean? It means that q has an eigendirection that corresponds to the eigenvalue zeta. So what kind of point is q? Well, we know that there are only two types of local actions. So since one entry of the local action at Q is multiplication by zeta, the other one must be 1. So suddenly, by knowing what happens at P, we have deduced what happens at another point Q further away on the line. So we have sort of propagated the action. It has become now a combinatorial game. So Q is a point of type zeta 1. Can we say more? Well, yes, we can continue this game. So what did we say? That P was of type 2, 2. And from this, we deduced that Q was of type 1, 0. So 1, 0 means that in one direction is multiplication by zeta, which is the direction of C1. And in the other direction is multiplication by 1, so it's the identity. So transverse to C1 at Q is another curve C, which is fixed. So from knowing what happens at P2, suddenly we know the behavior at the curve C, which is to the right. So what's happening in general? So I put P here, I called it P1. I put it in the center of the second picture. P1 is a point of type 2, 2. So I put the eigenvalue set together with the eigendirections. So if I look at the line that goes to the bottom right, what will happen around the point which is to the right? Well, it will have an eigenvalue of 1 in that direction and an eigenvalue of 0 in the transverse direction. So the line, which is slightly lighter, which is here, will be a fixed curve. Well, let's continue this game. Let's look at this fixed point. Suppose that this is the point of intersection between two rational curves. What can you say? Well, one eigendirection is 0. What do you know if one eigendirection is 0? In the local matrix, one entry will be multiplication by 1. So the other entry will be multiplication by zeta. So this is a toy point of type 1, 0. So in this direction, here you multiply by zeta. And if you multiply by zeta here, what do you multiply by at infinity? Well, 1 over zeta, so zeta squared. So this point, again, is a point of type 2, 2, and etc. And you perpetuate the game. So you know how to go from 0 to infinity. And you know also, if you know one direction at the point, you also know the other direction. So like this, knowing the action of p, if you have a tree of P1s, you can know the action along the whole tree. So let me first give you a simple application of why this is useful. So I'm giving you the following proposition. If you have an ordered tree non-symplectic automorphism, and suppose that it acts on the chain of rational curves. So you have rational curves that form a chain. Like here, for example, I drew a chain with four uh, rational curves. Well. Such an action is only possible if you have a multiple of three curves. So if you have five curves, seven curves, 11 curves, such an action will not be possible. Why? Well, let's look at the case when you have four curves. You can do it in general. 
if you want at home, it's the same argument. So first, if you have four curves, you cannot have a global symmetry of order three. So the only way you can have some automorphism is to really act on each line separately. You cannot turn the square and have an automorphism of order three. Why? Because the symmetries of the square, remember, these are of order eight, so global symmetries. Symmetries that act on the line as a whole. But three does not divide eight. So no possibility here. So therefore, each line itself must be preserved. Each line must be sent to itself. Okay? So since each line must sent to itself, you will have the point A, B, C, D, which are fixed. And what we are really wondering is what's happening in between these points. What's happening on the rest of the two lines? Well, let's look at the case on the left. Assume that the point A, A is of type 2, 2. Could also be of type 1, 0. Huh? But let's assume for a moment it's of type 2. What can I say about point B? Well, let's go to the right. So on the horizontal line, the action centered at zero is multiplication by beta squared. So around infinity, this is what we just did two slides before, it will be multiplication by zeta. So the eigenvalue corresponding to the horizontal line at B will be one, uh, which means zeta, sorry, it's fixed one and one, multiplication by zeta. So the eigenvalue corresponding to the vertical line will be identity. So the action is trivial on the vertical line to the right. So on, on the P1 BC, zeta acts trivially. Each point is fixed. Let's go now to the point D. What happens when you look at D? Again, the vertical uh, eigen direction corresponds to the eigenvalue data squared. Therefore, at infinity, so at D, this corresponds to the eigenvalue zeta, and this local model must therefore be a local model of type 1 zeta. So the action horizontally is trivial. Oh, but if you look at C, the action horizontally must look like multiplication by zeta. So there is a conflict here. You cannot glue the two pieces of information. So it's not possible to have an automorphism of order 3 where A is of type 2. For type 1, 0, you can do the same kind of diagram chasing and see that you get to a contradiction. So this little game of propagation already tells us that you cannot have any configuration you want of lines on your Petri surface. And this is very important information. So let's do another example. So a lot of Petri surfaces are what people call elliptic. So what does it mean elliptic? It means that they come with an extra map, pi, that sends every point to a point of E1. And the general fiber is an elliptic curve. So if I pick a, pick a point A on P1, what is pre-image? Its pre-image is an uh, elliptic curve. Now, in general, the pre-image will be a smooth elliptic curve, but there will be some singular fibers. And these singular fibers, we understand them pretty well. So Kodaira has done a study of these fibers in the 50s. And when you have a singular fiber, you will actually have one of these nine cases that I sketched on the right. So it could be a nodal curve, it could be uh, I1 singularity, so this is a chain of P1s, this is exactly the case we studied before. You could have a cuspidal curve and all the other configurations on the right. Okay. So in general what you really have is a tree of P1s, which is really nice. Because now assume I have an automorphism of my uh, K3 surface where I can show that each fiber is sent to itself. This is something which is not too hard to do in general. Then what I really need to do is what are the possible actions on the tree of P1s. And this is something we know how to do. So people have classified K3 surfaces. They know their Picard group. So the Picard group basically tells you the information on how curves intersect. But concretely what it means is that you can also say what are the rational curves on here. A K3 surface. You know, there's some ambiguity, but the global picture is there. So I'm going to take an example. I'm skipping some technical details here, but suppose you have an elliptic curve here with big U plus uh, EA tilde. So what does it mean geometrically? It means that you have an elliptic vibration. That's what your U tells you. And your EA tilde, that is, it tells you that you have a special fiber, which is of type uh, 2 star. So what does it mean to be of type 2 star? Type 2 star meaning that you have P1s 
whose intersection diagram is the same as the one of the uh, extended EA thinking diagram. So the fiber there, which is singular, corresponds to this messy configuration of lines. You also have uh, actually seven cuspidal curves. This is not told in, the, I mean, this is not obvious from the Picard group, it's something you can use easily. Well, you can play the same game. So what do you see? You see that this fiber does not have any global uh, symmetry. So each line must be sent to itself. Now let's look at line which I call C3. So line C3 is the one which is on the bottom of your singular fiber, which is vertical, and which has three other P1s which are incident to it. Okay. Since this fiber is uh, preserved and so are the other three, what does it mean? It means that my automorphism has three fixed points. Oh, but wait. What did we say? We said that if you have an automorphism of P1 with at least one fixed point, a fixed point can be chosen as zero and it looks like rescaling. And it will have zero and infinity fixed. But wait. Two points and here I have three. What's the only transformation of the form Z sent to some constant time Z which has more than two fixed points? Well, it can only be the trivial transformation. It can only be the identity. So, therefore, zeta tree is a fixed curve. So, that's nice because now at these three points, I know one eigen direction, which is just the one of this line, which corresponds to the eigen value one. So, zero, zero, zero. So, I can play my little game, and I will see that I will have three P1s, which are fixed, four isolated points, and my formula, which I told about in the beginning, my whole more complete reference formula tells me that the final curve I have is of genus 3. But this actually, we can also see it geometrically. We have an automorphism of order 3 on an elliptic curve. How many fixed points does it have in general? In general, it will have three. One will be the curve C1, which is a section, and there will be two others. So there will be a curve above P1, which is a double covering, and this double covering will have branch points. So every time it will meet a cusp here, the two branches will agree. And then also, at the end of my singular fiber, there's an extra point where these two branches will agree. So if you use now the Hurwitz formula, you can also deduce that you have a curve of genus tree. So a very global algebraic problem of finding symmetries of these K tree surfaces can actually boil down to a geometric or combinatorial game of studying automorphisms on basically graphs of p ones So it's a very nice technique, very down to earth, and it gives you a lot of useful geometry. So to go back to the original picture, to show that this is something pretty concrete, this is a common surface. It's a special case because here it's not properly embedded, there are singularities. But here I wanted to show you this picture once again because you can see actually some of the lines. So the ridges of some of the portions of this curve are lines. So you can imagine that if you know where the lines are moving, you can basically detect how symmetry acts on the whole K3 surface. And that will be it for today. Thank you for listening. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jimmy, for the talk. So, for the audience, do you have any questions to ask? Do you have any questions to ask? I think Ghana raised his hand. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Ghana? And we have a question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, please, the, 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 Okay. Okay. He's here. He's here. Yeah. The connection is very bad. Yeah, the connection is uh, seems a bit bad. Uh, but okay. But what is the question? Symmetries, we're looking at special symmetries which act on the volume form. 
So to understand this, basically you can pick any point which is fixed and look at the action on the volume form, and the volume form will be multiplied by theta 3. Unfortunately, it's hard to visualize. Uh, symplectic automorphism, which preserve the volume form, are the usual objects we work with. This non-symplectic automorphism, you can and so you have to play with your imagination, but it's hard to really visualize them. But it's really a part of the symmetry we see, but only those that play with the volume form. So we did this extra condition actually when we do this gluing that I mentioned, but it's really something non-standard otherwise. So are there any interesting cases of, uh, do we have any interesting cases of Z groups, which are examples, which are, uh, can that be your manifolds, or is there any connection with Z groups, or there, there's no connection there? Uh, I don't think there is a direct connection in this case. Uh -huh. So the, the, the varieties themselves are not groups. Okay. So what you have in, in the two-dimensional case, the, there are two types of calabiols. There were K-trees, and yeah. there were abelian varieties. Well, the abelian varieties, these are From uh, from any of the guests, uh, any questions? If you want to ask a question, just unmute uh, your so, uh, and then you can ask any question. Can you just raise your hand and, and ask a question? So okay, so this is a uh, so this is Jimmy. So and he's <laughs> I guess you can all see him, right? Uh, hello. Yes. Yeah, uh, University of Ghana, so can you see him or? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. So I, I guess... They turn camera on too early, they want to scare people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I guess, uh, buying any more questions, I guess uh, that, that will be the end of today's uh, seminar. So we will send uh, out more information later on for regarding future seminars. So stay tuned uh, for uh, for that. So Jimmy, do you have any concluding remarks to make before we log off? Oh, uh, I was very pleased to give a talk. It's a bit hard because you don't have the feedback of the audience, so you don't know when to accelerate or slow down. But yeah. uh, I hope I didn't go too slow or it was not too boring. Yeah, it, it wasn't boring. I guess what well, the next time, what we could do is that, I mean, I guess if you had any question, you could raise your hand and then you could stop and then you could they could be unmuted and then they could ask a question so that I guess uh, it makes much more interactive. Okay, so I just got uh, from the chat message that there were 60 listeners from Ghana and there were 10 other listeners from elsewhere. So how many do you have there where you are, Jimmy? Uh, there are people who are spread in the university, but I don't know exactly how many. So certainly a few, but I, I, I can't tell you. So the, the normal seminar room had a problem, so that's why I had to do it from the office and broadcast it even locally. Oh, okay, okay, see, okay, see, see, that. okay, okay. So I guess on the whole, probably had about maybe, a conservative about maybe 25 people conservatively, if we added 10 people who are logged on here. So there's six systems from Albania, system from Ghana is 22, and I guess from Canada and from the GSU, so that's quite a good number for the first seminar. So we hope to expand this and uh, I guess make it much more global, so uh, much more interactive, and then in the departments all across the world. That's the Verizon goal. Okay. Okay. So I guess thank you very much. And if you want to log out of the meeting, just uh, click on the top right hand corner, the log out uh, uh, icon or button, and that will log you out. So again, thank you very much. And let's say thank you to uh, to Jimmy for giving this uh, seminar talk. Okay. Yes. Sir. Okay. So someone from Quebec also. Okay. Okay. So okay. we have. Uh, okay. So I guess people are locking off uh, now and then. Um, okay. So from Belgium. Yeah. Did you tell them that to log off it's ten dollars per person? 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess yeah, people are yeah, are, are locking up now. So from Belgium, who, how many uh, who was from Belgium that uh, locked down? Uh, I think my mom listens. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there are other people or not. So. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, that's nice. She was a math yes. teacher. So. Oh, oh, your mom? Okay, I didn't know that. No, she was a math teacher. Okay. Okay. Well, that's okay. That's that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I guess uh, let's see. I I guess we can we can talk later. I guess about I guess how we can move on then. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you want to use this stuff to talk to other departments somewhere, you're always welcome. Oh, but thank you. Yeah, I, I, keep, I surely keep this in mind. It's a very nice tool. Uh -huh. It's a very nice yeah. idea. Yeah, that's a nice idea. So it's any, any, if you have any other ideas whether maybe maybe give a talk to in, to Paris, I guess, where you were last year, anywhere. It doesn't matter. Anywhere you want to, just tell me. You know, I, I, will, I will set up the meeting for you. Thank you very much, Anna. Yeah. Okay, then. Thank you. So we'll talk to you soon, then. Bye-bye. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.